On the breakfast, the Nigerian Governors Forum pledged to increase funding for primary health care by ensuring efficient budgeting allocation that aligns with the annual operational plans. Also on The Breakfast, we'll be talking sports as we have a, a journalist join us this morning on the show. Don't forget, we'll also be looking through today's newspapers, analyzing the biggest story of the day. It's a beautiful Friday morning and thanks for joining us. It's The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. I am Messi Bokwo. Promises to be two hours of fantastic, uh, great conversation with great insight and perspective right here. But as always, we'll start off with our top trending conversation. Now on the front burner this morning is the issue of the Emirate and, you know, the Nigerian government. Now the flag carrier of the United Arab Emirates disclosed uh, in a statement on Thursday, citing that uh, its inability to repatriate its earnings in foreign exchange from Nigeria as of last month uh, was a big issue. Now, let's also not forget that some time ago, you also have the Emirate asking Hadi Sirikar, a minister of aviation, to support the repatriation of his revenue amounting to $85 million. Nigeria is also facing a forex exchange crisis, and this has also affected, you know, the nation's national uh, currency. We're talking about the Naira now that has depreciated against the dollar. Hence, the decision to suspend all flights to, to and from Nigeria, effective from September the 1st, 2022. Now, the suspension is to limit further losses. This is what the Emirates is saying. The reason why they're embarking on this particular action, uh, the impact on its operational costs that continue to accumulate in the market. And the airline said that the suspension would limit further, uh, you know, loss of the market. But it's also important to remember that the International Air Transport Association had said that Nigeria was withholding revenue worth $450 million earned by the foreign airlines operating in the country. And just between the month of June and July, it was also a report where you had the airline saying they were going to suspend you know, flight operations to and from Nigeria. Uh, originally per week you had 11 flights that were operational they were going to reduce it from seven they had also raised you know this as a major concern uh, but this is quite worrisome the, the different reaction in different spaces a lot's really going on and uh, that has really really not been fantastic but also to mention is that you know the emirates had also uh, gone out of their way to uh, put out plans, I mean, just put out ways, try to solve the problem. They had proposed that they, they will pay for the fuel, but it will be in Naira. But that wasn't really accepted, you know, by the supplier. It wasn't something that was accepted. With all of this, Nigerians yesterday have been talking. It has generated different reaction. You know what that means. I mean, you, it means that you won't have, F, you know, aircraft uh, moving from Nigeria to Dubai and what have you, and you know that that's a destination for so for a lot of persons. We look at the economic implication, but one tweet that also um, generated reaction or that got people talking was the tweet that was from Shousani, and he tweeted because he's very I mean swift with Twitter and the internet. So he he also put out his thoughts and said, yeah, it was okay. You know, the Emirates can actually go their way because they're way too expensive and what have you. And that was not a fantastic comment because if I were him, I'm sure it would have been sensitive. He came under a lot of knocks from Nigerians saying, what are you saying? Because all the airlines are going to follow this particular, uh, you know, line. They're going to tow the line. It's more like do unto me. Uh, what you What you do is what you get. So it's like, hey, what you give is what you actually get. It's a garbage in, garbage out situation. And the fear for most persons is that you're going to have a lot of airlines who would also follow this path, that would tow this path of the Emirate, and it will become very difficult. But, I mean, what does this really make? You know, because when people constantly coming and come out, uh, moving from one space to the another, you understand that that also helps in boosting the economy. It's really saddening, but we're hoping that the relevant authorities will swing into action and as uh, something would you know, be done 
in terms of this particular regard. But that's it. Very, very uh, sensitive issue if you ask me right there. Uh, we have to move away from that one because we have another interesting uh, conversation. It talks about ASU rejects federal government's new salary structure. And uh, mm. so just when everyone thought that ASU and the federal government will come to a point where there will be a compromise and they will be in bed, but that's not the situation. And the, this strike has been on since the 14th of February up until this moment. And there were set, certain issues that were big concern for ASU. I mean, several issues of concern for ASU. Mostly you talk about the renegotiation of the 2009 agreement that was, I mean, that was, that they had, ASU had with the government. So some sort of renegotiation. A lot of issues and concerns that were raised was, you know, the payment platform, IPPIS, the UTAS, there are reports saying that, hey, uh, the federal government is saying, okay, we have actually done the trial and we've confirmed we're going to adopt it. And some people felt like this was going to be a good news. But apart from that, there was also funding, um, you know, backlogs, salary that wasn't really paid and the no work, no uh, pay salary seemed to be it. But in all of this, the, the bonded contention is that you know, uh, it's the funding. The government is saying we don't have resources. That's the crux of the conversation. And on the other hand, uh, you know, the union is also very bent on saying, hey, we're not going to take the back seat because we think that we have a lot of resources. We just think that we're an economy that's been very wasteful. Corruption is on the other side. There are lots of leakages. And so if we're able to, you know, sort the economy, sort out the economy, then it won't be a problem. So um, let's see if we can just take a little bit of the background. The leadership of the Academic Staff Union of Universities rejected what it described as a word salary package presented to it uh, at the resumed meeting of the federal government and ASU over the lingering strike action by the union. Now, ASU pointed out that the major reason given by the federal government for the misery offer, because they, they described this offer as misery, it's just the... Uh, Nothing offer uh, is the revenue issue, which is not tenable. That's what you're saying. So revenue is a major issue. Now, according to the president of the union, that's Asu, Professor Emmanuel Oshodoke, in a statement, he said that uh, the implementation of a special salary scale for university staff known as university salary structure, uh, the meeting that was resumed for the renegotiation of the agreement of 2009, uh, that was August the 16th, 2022. The government presented an award recommended consolidated university uh, academic salary structure prepared by the National Salary Incomes and Wages Commission to ASU. And ASU family rejects and still rejects the award, he said, because according to them, uh, it does not agree, it's not in tandem, you know, with the structure, with the entire process. It, it, it does not correlate with the uh, the process or the platform. I mean, you have all the uh, proceedings that should be respected uh, for all of this, and that's why it was rejected. And so uh, the issues that ASU family rejects and still rejects the award, according to the president, he revealed that the new draft agreement has all the major recommendations for funding of major component of the renegotiated 2009 federal government an ASU agreement, one of such recommendations is tax on cell phones and communication lines. It's very, it's very, very funny. So ASU had actually also recommended that, you know, as a way of generating revenue that the government, you know, should go ahead and tax the phone lines. And that's what we're experiencing now. Have you, have you witnessed that? It's so much, you know, to make calls these days and to even be on the internet because it was suggested as a means of generating revenue. But ASU, on the one hand, is really displeased. I think ASU is very, very displeased with a lot of things. One of them is the fact that uh, this was implemented without giving credit to them, without acknowledging them, you know, as the proponents or as the sole uh, provider of such solution. Very brilliant. But this is, these are the issues. At the end of the day, there's always, you know, local panels that says that when you have elephant fighting, two elephants, the grass suffers. And who is the grass in this scenario, the student? Because ASU on the one hand, uh, are they really correct? What are they asking for? Their concerns and the issues they have raised, are they very valid? 
it's, it's a question that you need to answer. On the other hand, is it okay when the federal government says they don't have resources? Is it also a thing that we should consider? Well, who suffers at the end of the day? The students. Because, you know, they have lost the academic calendar. And the international community, I mean, you also, uh, they're beginning to put an eye on, you know, the Nigerian educational system, especially when you want to have an education outside of here. They begin to look at some of these issues, thinking that, you know, it's a case of half-baked graduates out there because you, the curriculum, the syllabus, they're really followed from the beginning, you know, to the end, uh, some issues. But however, we still hope and we're hoping that there will be some sort of compromise so we're able to solve this problem once and for all. It's quite saddening that, you know, this strike might just continue for the remaining part of 2022. Because 2023 is almost here. And that's it. Another one on the top trending this morning talks about the Lagos state government that has extended, you know, the ban on Okada to more local government. Now, the Lagos state government has announced a ban on the operation of commercial uh, motorcycles, better known as Okada. In addition for local government in the state, the affected local government are Koshofe, uh, Osho di Solo, and Shomolu, and Mushi. Now, it might also interest you that in May, Babajide Shongolu, the governor of Lagos State, had announced a total ban on commercial motorcycles operation in six local governments, which includes Ikeja, Surulere, Etiosa, Lagos Mainland, Lagos Island, and Apapa. So you have an additional four now. So four to six, we're looking at 10. And some persons are saying that this might just be a gradual process, you know, to face out uh, Okada in the state, right? But the question, there's some, there are a lot of issues because this is really not the first time you have the Lagos state government saying, hey, we're banning uh, activities of Okada. Now, yes, they're very interesting. It just popped out on the social media. as a, a prominent, you know, figure, one of reality TV stars who posted a video. She was quite excited to have actually boarded uh, an Okada to make it to the airport because at some point, you know how it can be with the traffic, man. If you don't even leave very early, then it's very definite that you're going to miss your flight. And so she took to social media, tango for social media, Twitter, Instagram, and what have you. So she posted that, hey, I'm very excited that I have to board a, a, a bike, you know, from my destination because I don't have to miss my flight. And I'll start very, very, um, you know, exorbitant amount but i'm sure that she's capable of paying and she, she paid so the question here is how far is the implementation because it's one thing for government to say hey we're doing this but what's the level of implementation to some extent in some regions i mean some parts of uh, you know lagos you find out that the enforcement is on the high for instance lagos island in some places you find out that hey uh, you you don't really see the presence of the uh, motorcyclists or motorcycle around uh I, I really can't say for other parts. That's where that video emanates. And you can see that it was on a highway. It wasn't even really, you know, in the feeder roads or what have you. Oh, but this is on a highway. But the argument still continues. It hasn't really stopped because at the first uh, instance of saying, hey, there's a restriction for six local government, the major conversation is about the loss of job. Some people say this is a means of livelihood for a lot of persons. And how would you take that source of, you know, livelihood from them. So uh, that conversation has not changed from what it is with the additional four local governments restriction or ban, if you like to say, Nigerians are still talking, Lagosians are still complaining about what becomes of this person when they are jobless because it's a source of their income. And what are we doing, you know, to curb the rate of crime and criminality? Because a lot of persons are also of the view that crime and criminality would actually thrive at this point in time. When people become jobless, I say an idle mind or man is a devil's workshop. And so a lot would happen. That conversation has not ended, but it doesn't feel like, you know, the government is actually going to, you know, take the back seat or, you know, shift grounds on this particular one. And another communication also is the issue of, uh, What's the plan? I mean, what provision has been made? Because if you see some of the um, areas and communities or local government where you have this ban uh, being put out, you also want to agree with me that you have feeder roads. 
these are feeder roads. And so some persons will need to find a means of moving from a particular point to the other. It becomes, you know, quite worrisome. And others have also raised concern about, you know, the road structure in, to in terms of how, how motorable are these roads. I mean, you're saying, hey, uh, we're banning uh, Okada, as popularly known, from plying this particular road or route. But what's the provision? Uh, if you look at the roads, they are in a terrible state. They're not motorable. And so for those persons who even own vehicles, how do they even navigate their way? It's a lot of issue. I mean, it's a lot to even think about. But we can only be hopeful and think that things will definitely get better. That's the size of our conversation this morning on Top Trending. We'll take a break. When we we'll return, we'll be looking at the front pages of the National Dailies. We'll have great analysis from G.J. Johnson, all things Benio Corp. Please stay with us. <laughs>